Hey, it's good to be with you again as we're continuing our small group Bible study series out of James. James 5, we're going to be moving forward through verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, kind of forms what appears to be a very appropriate, very logical, but certainly spiritual uh, continuation of where we were before. We, we talked uh, uh, last time about uh, farming the patient process of farming. We talked about precious produce, and we talked about what the Lord desires to do in and inside and in and out of our lives as Christians. You know, His desire uh, for us is to grow more into the likeness of His precious Son. And, and as we've said, even more important than anything that we'll do or accomplish uh, for the name and sake of Jesus Christ, it's us that God desires more than anything. So, you know, as we're moving from, I guess you could say, patient farming, uh, we're also going to be examining and considering some things today that in and out of the life of a Christian could spoil the fruit uh, of our example. Uh, things that we need to be mindful of. Uh, again, the word patience is kind of a continuing underlying theme of James. And, and that will form some of the basis of some of the things that James will offer under the leadership of Holy Spirit in the verses that we're going to cover today. So from patient farming to the potential of having spoiled fruit. Uh, again, James kind of throwing up before us a, a bit of a, a warning, some things to consider quite seriously. Uh, let me go ahead and read these verses. We're going to pray, and then we'll go ahead and get started. got a couple of illustrations I'd like to use today as we uh, go through our Bible study time together. Here are those verses out of James chapter 5, starting in verse 9. Do not complain, brethren. Again, kingdom family letter. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. Okay, interesting. So that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge, capital J, is standing right at the door. You know, the only righteous judge and the only one truly capable and qualified of discerning and working through any matter, the only one who knows all things about all things, is our righteous judge, Jesus Christ. Sometimes we appoint ourselves as judge. Happens all too often. We're not capable in and of ourselves. Verse 10, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those who endured blessed. We have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Let me read that verse again. We count those blessed who endured, those who endured, uh, that's a blessed example for us and, uh, so, and, and an example that we can, uh, we can follow. Uh, again, the endurance of Job. I like that about Job. We hear about the patience of Job. I like the endurance of Job. Um, and the continual, continuation of verse 11 there, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for these verses. Thank you for how, Holy Spirit, you speak and you teach and you challenge to change. Hold us accountable to the principles and precepts of your word, and uh, may we be willing to allow you to do the work in us that will allow us to once again be more like your precious son Jesus. That is our prayer. We do love you so much and we thank you. Thank you for again the work of the cross and the hope of that empty tomb. But most of all for Jesus and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Patient farming. Spoiled fruit? We certainly hope not. Reminded, though, regarding the hardships, uh, the pressures of this particular life in which we live. Uh, Paul wrote about it like this in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He said this regarding the sufferings of this world. He said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You know, Paul giving us at least one reason as to why things happen in this life. First of all, it's a fallen world, and it's prone to uncertainties, hardships, complications. 
Paul says one way, one way that we can look at this is that it better prepares us for what is to come one day for those in Christ when we leave this world, a fallen world, with the curse of sin upon it, and what we'll be experiencing one day in heaven when we arrive. Paul said, if you look at the difficulties we face now, those pale in comparison to what we will one day experience in heaven. So as, as we think about difficulties that we will, uh, we will encounter, it's a will, it's not a if, it's a will, unfortunately. We also can take this a bit further and think about those things that we will endure as a result of our faithful stand for Jesus Christ. Again, one of my favorite Bible commentarians, Dr. Warren Wiersbe, makes this statement. Let's take this with us as we continue to go through these verses today. Dr. Wiersbe said in one of his commentaries, the will of God will never lead you where God's grace cannot keep you. So if God is leading you towards something, and if you're determined to carry that assignment out in faithful obedience, we ought to expect some form of opposition. So we face difficulties just based on the nature of the world in which we live. We, we also are tempted to wander uh, you know, the, the sin nature inside of us continues to rear its old, ugly head from time to time. But when we desire to be faithful and we carry out the assignment that God has laid out before us, uh, we, we could be met there with opposition as well. We'll suffer, as the Word says, and the Word is very prominent in, in the Bible, persecution. Um, you know, Jesus Christ himself talked about, you know, it's blessed if we're persecuted for his name and his sake. So, you know, when we're thinking and evaluating difficulties that we'll face, Dr. Wiersbe said, listen, if God's will is leading you toward an assignment that uh, he desires for you to carry out for him, he'll never lead you to a place where his grace won't keep you and provide for you and enable you to be seen through. So difficulties come in different forms. Uh, we just need to know that we've been built for whatever may be coming our way. So... You know, I, I'm reminded, this, this is a picture that I keep in my office on the wall. I'm a collector of a lot of things. Um, when I look at this particular picture, I, I see a lot of things here. Uh, this was taken after Hurricane Michael came on board the panhandle of Florida. Michael came on land in that panhandle area uh, in early mid-October of 2018. It was a Category 4 hurricane in that particular area of the Gulf of Mexico on the Gulf side. We, we hadn't seen anything quite like this. Now, on the Atlantic side, these can unfortunately take place. This had wind speeds, Michael did, of uh, at one minute's time, of uh, sustained at 160 miles per hour. What you see here is just devastation everywhere. Uh, and when you take note of this, I mean, my goodness, uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of what's there has just been leveled and scattered all over creation. Except, we've got one house down here toward the bottom of that photograph, and one on the other side of that that reaped the benefit of the strength of this particular house. Uh, you'll see that white house there, um, and, and my goodness gracious, the roof is intact, the structure is intact, and this is a fascinating photograph, and I think it's quite popular. It's been seen by many people. Uh, this house was owned by Russell King and his nephew, Dr. Lebron Lackey. They are from Cleveland, Tennessee. They had security cameras on the side of this house, and they said when Michael came on land, on shore, there at Mexico Beach, Florida, he said that house was shaken like the wing of an airplane. Uh, and, uh, but why is it left standing? That's the question that a lot of folks would ask when they looked at this picture. Why this house and why none of those around it? Well, it's how that house was, was built. Uh, I understand that if you build a house on the Atlantic Ocean side, you're, you're going to have to uh, come up to a, a code that would allow that house to withstand wind speeds of up to 175 miles an hour. If you build on the panhandle side, the code actually is up to anywhere from 120 to 150. This house was actually built 
to withstand wind speeds of up to 250 miles an hour. Uh, the question that came up to them about this house was, was, you know, was why, and they wanted to build a house that would withstand what they referred to as the big one. The, the quote was this, we wanted to build it for the big one. We just never knew that we'd found the big one so fast. Hurricane Michael. But when I think about the big one, and that could come in any number of ways in our lives, whatever that big one or whatever those ones may be, however intense they may appear to be, with Holy Spirit residing inside of us as God's children, we've been built for whatever it is. This is a reminder to me of the strength of God inside of us, that even though this world is uncertain, even though things can come in waves that seem to be more intense the next one than the one before, we have someone inside of us who has overcome this world. What is it that the Word tells us? Greater is he that is within us than he that is within this world. What a great promise. What a great promise. So, knowing that, we proceed through the Scripture. And, and James writes for us here in verse 9 of chapter 5. He says, Don't complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may be not judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Uh, how tempted are we at times to allow others a rite of passage in our life in such a way that our emotions start to well up within us and we start to lose self-control? Uh, I had my mother uh, at a doctor's appointment here just very recently was sitting in a waiting area while she had been taken for an x-ray. A lady who was sitting over a few feet from me looked over and happened to take note of some of the things that I shared with the receptionist when we entered into the office area there. And one of those things had to be symptoms regarding COVID. Had I experienced this or that? And we kind of went down that screening questionnaire. And then I just happened to make mention out of my mouth of my own volition that my mom and I both we're a few weeks past our second vaccination. We've been fully vaccinated and we're a few weeks past that. I just thought that might be something useful. Well, this lady who was also having some tests done that day just happened to be with me in a waiting area and she just offered a question about my vaccination. And one of the things that she asked about my vaccination was, had I been forced to take that? Now that's kind of a leading question in some ways and there are some strong opinions on both sides of the fence regarding COVID vaccinations, but I should have left well enough alone, but I decided to entertain conversation with this lady, and I did so, I think, in the beginning with good intentions, but she had some very strong opinions that I'm sure the folks working in that office had no interest in hearing from either side, and as we began to talk further, I began to get a little worked up inside as if to say, with the tone of my voice, ma'am, I know what I'm talking about here, and you could be misinformed. Now, that's a dangerous place to go. And, and listen, in and of ourselves, there's some sort of entitlement about uh, where we stand and what we know and our demand to be right in the midst of a conversation. I had no business going there, and I went further and longer than I probably should have had. James is trying to say this for us here in verse 9. Enough of my story. Be, be careful about complaining. Be careful about entitlement. Be careful about demanding that we be right in each and every situation. And especially when it happens brother against brother or bro, sister against sister, brother against sister. When it, when it involves kingdom family, and I didn't know this lady standing with the Lord certainly, but you know what? I'm not sure if I portrayed the Lord as faithfully as I could have. James says, listen, just be patient and not allow the emotions within you to well up that could take a conversation and turn it into some sort of a debate, inquisition, uh, heaven forbid, our argument. We don't want to go there. First of all, we don't know everything. There's only one judge, capital J, that knows all Let's just be patient and listen. Certainly, self-control. And, and one of the things we find in the midst of conversations, 
is that we'll find ourselves maybe going into places where we would like to blame others uh, for the things that we do. Hey, listen, blame shifting is one of the oldest tricks in the book. Go to Genesis 3, uh, verses 11, 12, and 13. Adam and Eve, when they encountered God in the garden, you know, Adam, you know, it's the woman you gave me. Eve, it was the serpent who deceived me. You know, I, listen, sometimes our complaints against others stem out of a conviction of knowing that we may be in the wrong and then we try to blame something or others for our own wrongdoing. Let's don't go there. Let's be patient. Let's be self-controlled and poised. And let's allow, the listen, the, the picture and the reflection of Jesus Christ's control in all matters uh, override anything that we may say or how we say what we say. So again, Christian to Christian, my goodness, we've got to be very, very careful. But those who may not know Christ, you know, we've got to be careful how we handle conversations. Uh, we just want to portray Jesus, okay? Verse 10, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Listen, when we start talking about enduring under pressure and hardship, let's think about some of the prophets in the Old Testament to the Jews who were hearing this particular part of James's letter, they could identify with this. They could go back in their mind and remember what happened to Jeremiah. Goodness gracious, I believe he was thrown into an abandoned well, left there to die, but it was kind of a shelter of protection when Jerusalem was laid siege to. Uh, those were his own people that did that to him. We know how Daniel and Ezekiel were treated. So, it, it, you know, and they bore up faithfully under pressure, we can go to those examples and see how those withstood hardship and faithfully came through, maintained the integrity of their witness. You know, Jesus again in Matthew 5 talked about, you know, what a blessed position it is in, it is for us to be in when we're persecuted for his name and for his sake. So again, those models. And then James goes further on here. You know, we count those who've endured. You've heard the example of, of Job. And, and again, you know, that phrase of comparison or analogy that people make over the years, you know, well, you know, the patience of Job. Yes, I guess, you know, that, that certainly can apply, but it's the endurance of Job that I admire and how he was able to come through. I, I love what is said in Job chapter 23, Verse 10 here, Job's part of Job's third reply to Eliphaz here, and he says this in verse 10 of chapter 23, but God, but he, but he knows the way I take, and when he, God, has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job was able to maintain that spiritual center. He knew that through hardship he would come through uh, in, in a way that was pleasing to God. So, you know, we, we've heard of that. We've seen the outcome, James says, of the Lord's dealings. And to the Lord, what is full of compassion and is merciful. He'll provide all that we need to be seen through. And then in verse 12, there he comes back to this. And I, I like this verse. But above all, my brethren, don't swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Your yes is to be yes and your no, no. How many times have we encountered people who always seem to have to preface everything they say with, now I swear this is true, uh, or, you know, or I swear this, or listen, I, I, I swear it's the truth, uh, you know, or, or make some sort of a promise on top of that, you know, as a way of validating what they say. If a person has to do that to uh, lend to their credibility and integrity, they must have a problem with it to begin with. Christians should not have to swear or provide oaths with anything. Your word should be good. Say your yes to be yes and your no, no. I like that. Again, the, the, some of the clear-cut things that James says under the leading of Holy Spirit just get right to the heart of the matter. And we can look and see what can happen in the lives of some of the stoutest people of faith that we know in the Bible based on their impatience. Moses, Abraham, Peter to be examples. Great men of faith. But those whom under pressure uh, made some decisions that they wished that they hadn't. So uh, again, looking at James 12 and thinking about that, listen, our integrity, our character, 
uh, will authenticate those things that the Lord may place on our heart to say to others. Uh, let's don't allow the example of our life, the rule of our life, to require us to think that we've got to validate everything we say by the oaths that we make. So uh, as we're coming down home stretch here, I've got a couple of things I'd like for you to consider maybe in discussion. Uh, first of all, listen, we're not going to be able to grow and develop without hardship. That's a hard word, and a young Christian might not understand that completely. Our faithful example under pressure can go a long way to validate anything that we might, uh, might want to say on Christ's behalf. But in and of ourselves, we're just not going to be willing to put in the effort and the discipline and the time to grow closer to God and to be formed more into the likeness of Christ. It's going to probably come through hardships and difficulties. And, and also, you know, when, when we encounter people who just seem to be leading us, uh, pushing those buttons, so to speak, uh, in order that they can get a rise out of us emotionally, uh, listen, knowing that the strength of Christ, Holy Spirit lives inside of us, let's just not be willing to give others too much rite of passage, too much authority in our life that would enable us in some way, shape, or form to lose our cool. Uh, we don't have to go there. So here's some questions, then we'll close. How quickly are you to allow things to, uh, well, I'll say this. How quickly are you to assert yourself strongly within conversations and almost forcefully make it seem like you, you, you not only are right, you, you're going to be right? Uh, how quickly does that occur? Listen, remember the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, and specific to verse 23, it talks about a Spirit-led self-control, poise. It's kind of an athletic term. You know, we never allow the game to get bigger than us. We want to be able to think clearly. Boy, what a great life principle there as well. Uh, let's also ask ourselves, you know, what are some of those buttons that our adversary likes to push that would lead us toward uh, uh, losing our cool, <laughs> losing our poise? What are some of those areas that our common enemy likes to exploit? Uh, he knows your history. He knows where to go. He knows those places where you can be pricked. Let's don't allow him any rite of passage. Uh, listen, we've heard it before. Uh, the enemy can, if he can establish a, 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 a foothold, he can create a stronghold. And, and think about your spiritual life and where you are right now, today, when you watch this video. Can you look back, let's say 30 days, let's go back three months, six months, a year, and can you sense that you're further along spiritually now than you were then? I hope you can. I hope you can. And part of, uh, well, an important part of our growth process will be our willingness to yield uh, to the Holy Spirit's leading and to not allow the things of this world or the people of this world to uh, move us into places where our Christian witness could be compromised. We just don't have to go there. But, uh, you know, whether it's a being provoked by someone or something, or whether it's just the hardships of life, the sufferings of this present world, and uh, that we can't help, uh, we just want to be faithful in stewarding the name of Jesus Christ along the way. Let's allow His strength in and through us to be the rule of our life. Listen, it's not going to be perfect, but we just want to be consistent and faithful along the way. And God will be our ever-present help. God bless you. See you next time.